Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Orthodox Nationalist. This is Matthew Raphael Johnson. It is the last day in September of 2020. I tried to uh, think of something to come up with for the display that I saw just a few hours ago. See, normally I don't watch those exercises because I don't vote. I don't vote for very good reason. Um, but because of the possible comedic elements in this thing, I um, I decided against my better judgment to watch it. And I guess I wasn't disappointed. I knew that the intellectual level will be as it always is, between third and fifth grade. I don't mean to insult the little kids, but that's pretty much what it was. Um, and more importantly, though, it was marketed and packaged as a sporting contest. Those of you who still watch the NFL, and if you do, there's probably something wrong with you. Those of you who watch the NFL see how the games are presented. The music, the tone of voice, what the announcer says. And carrying the debates is no different than um, than uh, the network or the networks vying for the right to present NFL games. So they need to create a and of course, the NFL is has been rigged. It's always oh, has been. Uh, the courts have admitted this. Uh, it's entertainment, not sport, and it's no different here. They need to create a contest. They need to create something exciting. Um, most of you know that presidential debates are scripted from beginning to end, and this is no exception. There is no way a campaign staff is ever going to permit just two candidates to go at each other. Anything can be said. Usually the contracts for these uh, debates are pages and pages and pages long. What can be said, what can't be said. So, you know, they let him talk about Hunter. You know, I'm going to hit you on COVID, whatever. Absolutely no information of any use was imparted in that. Um, its sole purpose was to create a, um, uh, a sort of entertainment now, many of you know that I've, I've never voted. I've never seen the inside of a voting booth. And part of the reason is I'm simply too honest. I know, and I've been through this before. I'm not going to go through the whole thing now. But one of the biggest problems in voting is that you put your seal of approval on the charade. You know it's a charade. You know that what they say, whether it be in debates or elsewhere, has absolutely nothing to do with what they're going to do um, politically. There's no connection between the two things. So there's no purpose in, in voting. Um, that um, that the campaign rhetoric is somehow indicative of what a politician is going to do or what a politician believes. But one thing that struck me uh, more than anything else, and of course I've been, I've been, I've been mentioning this several times, is the mystification of the powers of the presidency. The presidency, of course, is a very deflationary position. It has very few powers. It's not about leadership, certainly not about a nation, or certainly even less so an empire. But these these two, uh, you know, I mean, Biden is just a, a backroom dealer. Donald Trump is a businessman who, you know, although he's done some good things, he's way out of his depth, um, especially in foreign policy. But if something happened when Obama was president, it's Obama's fault. If your toilet is clogged in 1995, it's Bill Clinton's fault. That somehow presidents run the economy Presidents lead a nation. Presidents are spokesmen for not just the people who voted for them, but people in general. And when you vote, you're permitting these politicians to speak in your name. 
if your candidate is victorious, you are in a small way responsible for what they do. People who don't vote are not. Um, but there is nothing more vulgar than these debates. Uh, at least in this case, it wasn't, I mean, it was, it was certainly boring. But they wanted this kind of constant tension, they wanted constant back and forth. Um, and, and one of the key, one of the key proofs of this is when, uh, the current president kept interrupting, uh, the moderator. And even when he realized that was going very badly, when he realized that he couldn't get his message out, when he, whatever, when he didn't have a message, but when he couldn't get it out, um, when it was going nowhere, he continued to do it. He didn't stop doing it. He didn't change his tactics. Um, their personalities have nothing to do with how these debates go. These are very, um, these are practiced and, um, you know, the very fact that they wouldn't, they wouldn't permit them to shake hands, which is ridiculous. You know, they were tested. Um, so this is to create this kind of, uh, um, this kind of environment. And of course, it has nothing to do with policy, it has nothing to do with it, it has nothing to do with political theory or ideas whatsoever. Well, there was a book that came out in 2009, The Cult of the Presidency, by John Healy. And it's his first book, and it's a good one. And his language is okay, but, but here's what he says about it. He says, neither left nor right, when he's referring to political factions, sees the president as the framer saw him, a constitutionally constrained chief executive with an important but limited job to defend the country when attacked, check Congress when it violates the Constitution, enforce the law, and that's it. Today, conservatives or liberals, it's the president's job to protect us from harm, to grow the economy, to spread democracy and American ideals abroad, even to heal spiritual malaise. Whether it takes the form of the sleeping sickness of the soul, as Hillary Clinton put it, or if it feels good, do it ethic, as diagnosed by George Bush, but few Americans see anything amiss in the idea that it's the president's duty to solve all large national problems and unite us in the service of a higher calling. The vision of the president as national guardian and redeemer is so ubiquitous that it goes unnoticed. And of course, that's put out by the Cato Institute, which um, shouldn't surprise anybody, but once in a while, they're correct on something. The presidency is certainly a, a very limited institution. Um, and I think it's much more limited even than he um, puts it out. He used to oversee cabinet ministers. Um, I mean, in theory, he can veto laws, appoint judges, approve treaties, but all of these have very strict limits. Uh, pardoning criminals, and but even his even his commander in chief position is based entirely on the declaration of war from Congress, and even there, of course, his direct operational command is delegated to actual military men. But even, even that's not enough. The, the, the war-making power was meant to be very rare and used solely in defense of the states from direct attack. I guess no one reads the Federalist anymore. And certainly no one reads the Anti-Federalist anymore. And even if they do, the, the language certainly doesn't mean the same then as it does now. And so people just impose their own views onto it. But ideas of leadership are condemned in the Federalists. Almost every time the word leader is used as a term of abuse. The very first Federalist paper says, of those men who have overturned the liberties of republics, the greatest number have begun their career by playing obsequious court to the people, commencing demagogues and ending tyrants. The very idea of a faction where leadership is connected to factions. It was a mass of people under the spell of a charismatic, manipulative leader. Mob rule wasn't really the problem, because it was a mob. It was a problem because it was controlled by an oligarch. Parties, factions, mobs, mass rule is connected with the idea of leadership. 
but right now the presidency is held in mystic veneration, as I've said from the very beginning, proving that people are naturally monarchists. But when it comes to this kind of thing, if, if, if tonight's event is any indication of the level of debate, and of course liberal democracy in its, in its postmodern guise is a wretched failure in every possible way. It is all based on puerile partisanship. And even that is, is typed out beforehand by the press. But discussions of the presidency are impossible. We're not even using the same language. Presidents have way too much power when Trump is in office, not enough when Obama is. They can't see past their, their, um, their, um, um, partisan lens. Academics and journalists fall into this perversion of their discipline. Procedures and institutions only matter if they're conducive to the official ideology. Um, there's just, um, for example, in 1790, George Washington wrote a letter to a colleague of his in Europe um, as some of an indication as to what the, the presidency was. And he was explaining um, that though he supported a certain research project improving agricultural methods, he wouldn't do much about it. He said, I know not whether I can with propriety do any more at present than what I've already done. I brought the subject up in my speech at the opening of the present session of Congress before the National Legislature. It rests now with them to decide what measures ought afterwards to be adopted for promoting the success of the great objects, which I have recommended to their attention. The presidency has no right to have a legislative agenda, to have a budgetary agenda. He certainly can't rule by executive order. He can't make foreign policy without the consent of the Senate, and certainly can have no war-making power without the House of Representatives. Um, he is a policeman. The concept of the executive refers to someone enforcing laws that are made by others. Lou Rockwell, who I haven't quoted in a long time, um, he's, I guess, a, a paleo-libertarian, wrote some time ago, in the 90s, he said, the presidency is seemingly bound by law, but in practice it can do just about anything it pleases. It can order up troops anywhere in the world, just as Clinton bragged about in his acceptance speech at the Democratic Convention. It can plow up a religious community in Texas and bury its members because they got on somebody's nerves the Justice Department. They can tap our phones, read our mail, watch our bank accounts, and tell us what we can eat or can, cannot eat, drink, and smoke. No prince or pope ever had this ability. This was written in the 90s. This is written before 9-11 and certainly before COVID. Right now we live in a society where uh, executives rule entirely by decree. At any time, they can use, um, uh, they could use some disease or some other invention to, um, to shut down an entire country. 